A series with the word hell in its title surely needs a closer look at all the angels and demons it's got. And let's just say it's important to know who's really an angel and who's the real demon. Having said that, today we're delving into a character breakdown of all the vampires, monsters, humans, cyborgs, werewolves, weircats and impossible characters that are a part of the bloody Helsing pantheon. This series spares no blood or any soul, except maybe a couple of them. But nevertheless... This fight fest of supernatural horror with advanced scientific experimentation merges the supernatural genre with science fiction so seamlessly, it often leaves you wondering how Kota Hirano pulled it off so convincingly. So today, we're going to tell you about the who's who of the Helsing canon and how they all make a unique difference to this impossible story of vampires, monsters, and humans bleeding it out. Alucard. Aptly titled with the nickname King of Monsters, Alucard is inspired by and borrows from the legendary character of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Alucard shares a lot of his story from the first original vampire in fiction, Dracula. Alucard is also an anagram of Dracula, and if you have any doubts about his ruthlessness, you only need to know that he spares no one. Except for those he considers his equal or an ally, like Father Anderson or Ceres Victoria. Alucard is an almost invincible supernatural entity in Helsing. He's seen dressed in an all-red flamboyant suit. But don't let that fool you, because you won't see him coming, killing, and vanishing. He'll do it all, <laughs> without a trace. The Helsing story tells us about Alucard's origins as a feared ruler who fought a dying battle for his own people and was pushed into a corner to his death. This is where Alucard became the first true vampire by transforming his human form to gain the supernatural form of the first true vampire. As for his kill count, there are millions that Alucard has defeated in his lifetime, and they're all a part of his army of familiars. But even Alucard has been defeated, and that too by a mere group of humans led by the first ace vampire hunter, Abraham Van Helsing. Alucard therefore believes that only humans are worthy enough to kill monsters like him, and that he would only wish to die at the hands of a human. He has a huge disregard for monsters and other artificially enhanced human beings, which is ironic because Alucard himself is a human transformed into a vampiric monster. After being defeated by Abraham Van Helsing, Alucard willingly becomes an ally of the Helsing organization that's established to counter vampire and monster threats to safeguard humanity. Alucard has since placed his allegiance to the Helsing organization until the present story, he serves under Sir Integra Helsing, the granddaughter of Abraham Van Helsing. It's also mentioned that post joining Helsing, Alucard's anatomy was further experimented on for him to be more obedient to the Helsing organization. There are only a few characters in Helsing that command Alucard's respect, Sir Integra being his superior in command, and Father Anderson as his human arch enemy, and the one man he considers is the only one worthy enough to kill him. Walter, the Helsing butler, is an all-time partner in crime for Alucard, and Ceres Victoria becomes Alucard's favored protege when he turns her into a true vampire because he appreciates her willingness to fight death and keep living. Being the protagonist of Helsing, Alucard is always in the crossfire, but he easily manages to overpower everyone throughout the storyline to help the Helsing organization keep a roof over their respect, if not their manner. Alucard is witty and has an acute observation for predicting the long game of the Millennium organization in the Helsing storyline. But even Alucard doesn't come off without a laundry list of character flaws and that's precisely what leads things to escalate. His almost corny self-belief blinds him to stay convinced that the Nazis and the Millennium organization are dead from his first encounter with them in 1944. And that's a major flaw considering how well the Millennium organization resurfaces under Alucard's watch. Secondly, he has a tendency to realize too much on his confidence that his immortality is unbeatable and no one can kill him by any means. This is a literal fatal flaw as the Major traps Alucard easily with a seemingly harmless weircat. Alucard is the most powerful being in Helsing without a doubt and highly influential in saving the day for Britain or the world in general. But he's not without flaws or a little ignorance that costs him almost everything in the series. The series doesn't really end on a pretty note for Alucard as he also loses his purity as a true vampire due to the invisible Schrodinger living inside him for the rest of his life. Even after spending 30 years to kill his own army of close to 3 million familiars and reviving himself as his original Alucard form, every bit of Schrodinger still technically lives in Alucard's body. Finally, Alucard accepts that a mere weircat was able to defeat him by just committing suicide that he failed to detect. Alucard that way is everything and almost nothing in the Helsing canon, but as a vampire, <laughs> you better not cause any trouble because you won't outmatch Alucard by a mile. Sir Integra Fairbrook Wingate's Helsing. Now let's get to understanding who's the ringmaster of the Helsing organization. Sir Integra Fairbrook Wingate's Helsing is the material noblewoman of the Helsing family, and she's the granddaughter of Abraham Van Helsing. Sir Integra runs all the operations of the Helsing organization as its bureau director. Descending from a long line of ace human vampire hunters, 
Sir Integra is a cold and calculating Protestant knight who's committed to carrying out the mission of her grandfather, the first human vampire hunter, Abraham Van Helsing. As a key character in Helsing, Sir Integra is like the point of contact for all the events that unravel in the Helsing series. She's strong, fiercely loyal to Britain, and has an unrivaled obsession for control over everything related to supernatural affairs in Britain or the world. She appears as a cigar-smoking, well-suited woman who can give you all the impressions of being a male despite her long, flowing blonde hair. But her voice and demeanor are enough to tell you that she's perhaps the most influential and powerful woman in the Helsing canon, and only second to the Queen of England in terms of political power. But for all her precision and calculating mania for control, Sir Integra falls pretty far behind the Major as a strategist, as she never sees the Millennium Organization's resurgence to power. By the time she realizes it, the Helsing Manor is caught in the crossfire as artificial vampires and ghoul armies launch an assault under the leadership of the Valentine brothers and later Zorin Blitz. Alucard regards Sir Integra as his master, just as he considers Abraham Van Helsing before her. But this is not because she's Helsing's granddaughter or a powerful head of the Helsing organization. It's purely on the merits of Sir Integra's character and the integrity she carries with it, pun intended. When a young Sir Integra was hunted by her own jealous Uncle Richard, she made her way to the dungeons of her family manor as a last escape route to safety, only to find the corpse of a vampire, and you guessed it right, it was Alucard. As her uncle shot her and spilled her blood on Alucard's corpse, the first true vampire came back to life and killed Sir Integra's enemies by protecting her. Seeing that Sir Integra had the will to kill her own family in the name of what's right, and the fact that she practically raised him up to life with her blood, Alucard devoted himself to her as her servant with a lifelong allegiance. Sir Integra is a person of principles, bravery, and an unstoppable will to never surrender, especially when it comes to carrying out her family's mission to keep the world safe from monsters. Sir Integra is relentless but with a strong moral code that you'll never see her violating. Unlike other characters in Helsing, whom you'll constantly question for their morality, Sir Integra hardly has any mark on her moral code till the very end. She's focused, and an acute improviser who can constantly adapt to the situation and keep surviving despite being a mere mortal human. That says a lot about her grit and determination when you see her constantly being under attack on both her life and the legacy of her forefathers. She plays a key role in keeping Alucard under check, and always loyal to the missions of the Helsing organization. Besides, she always proves to know how to play the defensive position well, despite being under a tremendous firefight inside the Helsing Manor. Although she fails to recognize the resurgence of the Millennium, Sir Integra is well prepared for the fight and has the iron will to walk into the Major Zeppelin when she's invited by him. She's defiantly outmatched an army of artificial vampires by killing one of them and forcing them to retreat. If this isn't enough, she broke apart the dome, protecting the Major in his Zeppelin and ripped him apart with a cannon. But nevertheless, Sir Integra is one of the few surviving characters of Helsing, along with Sadus Victoria and the resurfacing Alucard. This Iron Maiden is one woman you just don't want to mess with, because there's no saying what card she has under her sleeves. Even when she appears to stumble in the Helsing storyline, she rises to confront everything headfirst. So, stay out of her piercing sight, unless you love being in the presence of women who can command your self-respect and undying love for them. Integra's Mother The circumstances and birth of Sir Integra are shrouded in mystery. Integra's mother's name is never revealed, but a photo is shown with her carrying an infant Integra in her arms. Integra and her mother share a lot of physical similarities, and the only hint about her identity comes from the picture on Arthur Helsing's table. She wears a white and brown colored sari that tells us about her Indian identity. The woman's considered to be as good as Arthur's wife, and as a result, Sir Integra is not considered to be an illegitimate daughter. Walter C. Dornes. There's always a mole in the hole that hides in plain sight. And in the Helsing canon, no one pulls it off as effortlessly as Walter C. Dornes. Serving as the longtime butler of the Helsing family, he's the closest aide of both Sir Integra and Alucard, their longest ally and their most unexpected traitor. It's left uncertain if Walter was always working for the Millennium, but that's the whole point of being a mole or an undercover agent. Your story is always kept a mystery. The origins of Walter date back to the World War II era, when he makes a prominent attack on the Millennium Order with Alucard by his side. Both believe for the longest time that they killed off all members of the Millennium Organization, but that proves to be false when the Major makes a major comeback with an artificial vampire army and a very strong resurgence of the Millennium Organization. Walter is an ace weapons maker, and to his credit, he's created his infamously invisible microfilament wires that can cut through even Alucard, and also create bulletproof multi-layered shields. Besides this, he's also the inventor of Alucard's chief weapons, the Kassel, and then the Jackal. He also provides Sadus Victoria with her abnormally huge Halconan II, 
that's insanely heavy at 345 kilograms and comes with a grenade launcher. If this isn't enough, it's also got uranium-charged ammunition. Is there anything Walter cannot weaponize? Nope. And that's why he's aptly called the Angel of Death in the Helsing canon. Walter has two major personalities with starkly different appearances. As the Helsing butler, he appears as an old man similar to what your usual Alfred looks like in a Batman story. But as he turns into a traitor and resurfaces as an artificial vampire for the millennium, Walter transforms into this hyper-masculine and sexually attractive assassin you just can't take your eyes off, no matter how deadly he is. He's fast, insanely angry, and with only one goal in mind, to kill Alucard. The whole switch to Millennium shows us that Walter has a personal agenda for becoming a traitor and joining the Millennium. He's always been jealous of Alucard's power and position in the Helsing organization. Alucard commands more respect than Walter in the eyes of Sir Integra and Ceres Victoria. This creates a very complicated jealousy for Walter to ignore, as both Sir Integra and Ceres are two characters Walter deeply loves and admires. Knowing that he'll always be second to Alucard in the eyes of his two most loved people, Walter doesn't hesitate to join the Millennium if it gets him a chance to kill Alucard and prove who's stronger and better in comparison. Secondly, Walter always feared the onset of old age that comes with being a human. This also adds to his jealousy of Alucard. He never liked being considered second in any way, and his old age only haunts him about the fact that he'll die as a common butler, and Alucard will live on as the undisputed champion in the eyes of Sir Integra and Ceres Victoria. There's something else that Walter as an artificial vampire commits when he joins the Millennium. As his face-off with Alucard progresses, it's shown that Walter can even de-age himself unlike other artificial vampires of the Millennium. He keeps going younger and younger as the fight progresses in an attempt to mock Alucard that he can grow stronger by taking on the form of his younger self from the past. It goes on for so long that Walter achieves the body of a teenager, his own teenage body from his past. All of it to kill Alucard and prove that he's the best and far superior fighter in a one-on-one -on -one battle. However, this jealousy-fueled personal agenda doesn't work out in the end as he plans. By the time the Alucard vs. Walter duel ends, the Major runs out of his patience to give Walter the chance to defeat Alucard. Because by now, Alucard drinks the blood of millions of people who died in the Battle of London and gains new familiars who replace the ones killed by Father Anderson. A desperate Walter pleads with the Major to give him one last chance, but the Major humiliates him and tells Walter that Alucard is beyond his capabilities to kill. Since Alucard has gained new familiars, Walter is simply useless compared to him. This hurts Walter a lot and eventually leads him to give up his quest to kill Alucard and simply accept his death after killing off the Professor. Walter is definitely good, even great as a combatant and weapons expert but his jealousy drives him to an insane obsession for Alucard's death. His death only brings pity in the eyes of his favoured Sir Integra and Ceres Victoria. Walter simply dies the tragic death of an anti-hero who just loses all shreds of his humanity, respect and integrity. All of it to his jealousy. Now you know where jealousy can take you, so better take notes from poor old Walter. Ceres Victoria. Who doesn't love an underdog, right? And Ceres Victoria isn't just that, but a lot more. You can perhaps call Ceres Victoria the perfect combination of humanity and monstrosity brought alive. And this true vampire becomes one of the best decisions made by Alucard in his otherwise gory vampire career. Ceres Victoria is introduced as a timid police officer who's about to die but not yet willing to give up on her life. Alucard appreciates Ceres Victoria's determination to live and turns her into a true vampire and becomes her mentor by inducting her into the ranks of the Helsing organization. Ceres always appears in her police uniform and has a high moral standard that no adversity can tempt her to break. She's a loyal protege of Alucard and is often dotingly called by him as Police Girl. She's also a loyal follower of Sir Integra and has a high regard for her fellow officers in the Helsing organization. But don't let that fool you. Cyrus also follows her gut most of the time by conducting her own covert investigations to help the Helsing organization by going out of her way to take up risky operations she's not ordered to conduct. For most of the series, Ceres is hesitant to drink human blood to keep up with her vampiric form, but eventually gives in. She's armed with her favorite Harkonnen, and then the monstrous Harkonnen too that makes her a killing machine every Helsing villain underestimates. Apart from having the stereotypical true vampire's powers, she can also manipulate third eye illusions. It helps her defeat Zorin Blitz's illusions, overpower her, and kill her finally with Pip as her familiar. She also possesses the power to use Shadow Matter when her left arm is severed by Zorin Blitz. She can easily manipulate Shadow Matter to use it to attack or defend herself. What's more, she can use Shadow Matter as her wings to fly at high speeds like a bullet over any place during the Battle of London. 
Cyrus, though a naive underdog, serves a key role in dismantling a lot of troubles for the Helsing organization. From doing personal investigations to keeping up the morale of her fellow soldiers, Cyrus also kills the problematic Zorin Blitz and provides a lot of relief to the Helsing organization with this defensive act. This helps her bring down a primary killing machine of the Millennium, finally allowing Alucard the bandwidth to focus on more major problems. With the dignity and morality of a human intact and the ruthlessness of a true vampire, we don't think there can be a nobler true vampire like Ceres Victoria. You can trust Ceres Victoria with your organization and your life. <laughs> you have our word on that. Ceres Victoria's mom. Ceres Victoria may be a timid police girl trying to find her place in the police force, but her past fuels her desire to be an unbiased instrument of justice. It's revealed that even though she's very shy and often takes the bullying of her superiors, she has an iron-like motivation to never quit the police force and it all comes from her childhood trauma. When Ceres Victoria was still a little girl, she was orphaned by a mafia gang who caught up to her father's undercover missions. Her father was a policeman himself and was a member of an undercover ops unit responsible for bringing down one of the most lethal and dangerous mafia gangs of his time. As truth catches up to Ceres' father, it's too late to find a safe house from the government or go into hiding with his family. Before he could even warn his wife and little Ceres about his exposure, this mafia gang sends two of its hitmen to kill Ceres Victoria's father in their home. Ceres Victoria's father does his best to keep them off from finding the rest of his family, but even that doesn't work out. After killing Ceres Victoria's father, the two hitmen try to find her mother and the little girl who'd soon go on to become the police girl. Ceres Victoria's mother hides the little girl in the closet, but that's all in vain. The two hitmen brutally killed Ceres Victoria's mother just for the fun of their hunt. The little Ceres Victoria witnesses the brutal assault of her mother and stands helpless. Until one of the hitmen angers her beyond the limits of her childhood innocence, Ceres Victoria immediately charges at him with a fork and manages to stab a fork through his eyes. However, this resulted in Ceres Victoria receiving her first lethal gunshot to her gut. If this rampage wasn't enough, the hitman then goes on to claim that he wasn't done with Ceres's mother and her body was still warm. What followed was that the hitman forced Ceres to watch as he violated her almost dead mother. Ceres could do nothing to stop her attackers as she watched her dead mother being raped while she lay in a pool of blood and in indescribable pain. This event left a huge and traumatizing wound on Ceres Victoria, and she eventually followed in the footsteps of her father to join the police squad. Ceres Victoria's dad Ceres Victoria had a really noble and loving family, yet her father's profession naturally put all of them at risk of death and worse. Being a cop, her father worked as an undercover agent to take down one of the most notorious gangs in the city. It stated that Ceres Victoria's father had been close to taking down a major mafia ring when he was discovered and his cover was blown. What followed was what we described in the last entry, and it's her father's lifestyle that a young Ceres hoped to emulate after emerging from that, despite the obvious risks associated with the job. This traumatic event serves both as a motivation for Ceres to join the police force and also as a part of Zorin Blitz's allusions to torture Ceres Victoria through her most traumatizing memories of her parents' tragic murders. Pip Bernadotte Speaking of Ceres Victoria and her closest relationships, Pip Bernadotte initially comes across as a condescending officer in the Helsing ranks. He loves mocking Ceres and has a hard time believing that she's actually a true vampire created by Alucard. He's always doubtful of Ceres Victoria's efficiency and has a borderline misogynistic view toward the police girl's capabilities for any mission under the Helsing organization. However, Ceres and Pip Bernadotte's relationship grows more in the love-hate direction as the Helsing series moves on. There's even one instance when Ceres complains about being harassed by Pip and his other officers when they use lewd remarks to mock her every time. However, out of this love-hate relationship, a strong loyalty grows between Pip Bernadotte and Ceres Victoria. Pip Bernadotte is a mercenary who works with the group The Wild Geese, and almost six generations of his family have been mercenaries before him, all of them as members of The Wild Geese. Unlike most mercenaries, Pip prefers to use a revolver over an automatic pistol and dresses up like the heroes or bandits seen in a classic western movie. The wild geese under the leadership of Pip are hired by Helsing organization after they lose their troops following the Valentine brothers' attack on the Helsing Manor. Since the start of his team up with Ceres, he has doubts about her capabilities but not when the real fight starts. Pip ensures that Ceres is accompanied with all the forces of the wild geese working under her command. Pip also accompanies Alucard and Ceres for their mission to South America in Brazil. When Tubal Cain Alhambra ambushes Alucard with Brazilian military police, it's Pip who comes in as a rescue and helps Alucard and Ceres escape from the aftermath of the bloody face-off between Alucard and Alhambra. Later, Pip follows Ceres Victoria when they're both tasked to protect the Helsing Manor after the Major openly declares war on London. 
All through this time, Pip shows off to be a hard-hearted mercenary, but it's very obvious that he's in love with Ceres Victoria. It becomes more and more evident as he commands his wild geese to give their complete obedience to Ceres. But nothing tops his claim of love for Ceres like his self-sacrificing death at the hands of Zorin Blitz. While Zorin is torturing Ceres with her illusions, Pip stands up for Ceres and stops the illusions. This finally allows Ceres to break free from Zorin's mind buggery, but this also brings Pip his final death blow as he's killed by Zorin Blitz in return for stopping her. As Pip lays bleeding and dying on the Helsing Manor floors, Pip offers his blood to Ceres to drink and indirectly pledges that he loves her. Ceres, having drunk Pip's blood, gets her lover as her first familiar, and together they kill Zorin and later on the captain of the Millennium. This is definitely one bloody love story nobody sees coming, but we still think Ceres and Schrodinger would make a more adorable match. Pip's Deputy Pip's deputy forms a key source of his command over the wild geese and is the one who helps oversee that they're fully prepared for the worst case scenario. As the right-hand man of Pip, this deputy has a deep trust in Pip's judgment and is always a handy assistant to Pip. Since Pip has the tendency to improvise his plans depending on the fighting scenarios, his deputy seems to be an equally good mercenary, improvisational fighter, and an adaptive and trustworthy brother-in-arms for Pip Bernard Dutt. Overall, if you have intentions to join a mercenary group, you'll need allies in your team like this deputy. Peter Farguson The old wise man is a familiar trope in the supernatural and fantasy genre. These wizened old men play characters usually called the supernatural aid by mythologists. This character plays an instrumental role in developing major characters that are destined for a greater purpose and a higher calling to save humanity. In Helsing 2001, Peter Farguson serves this role with regards to Ceres Victoria. As the commanding officer of all human soldiers of Helsing, Peter Farguson is deeply respected and appreciated for his role in managing and being the first response to all supernatural threats that the Helsing organization is duty-bound to stop in Britain. Peter Farguson is a military veteran who fought in the Gulf War and eventually joined the Helsing organization as its chief of first responders squad. Peter Farguson is seen wearing a green overall military uniform and also uses night vision equipment that only covers one of his eyes. The night vision goggle is zoom enabled and can be used only with a sniper rifle. He leads the majority of the operations to neutralize the artificial vampire and ghoul threat we see in the start of the series. This involves conducting investigations, responding to attacks, keeping the news of the attacks from spreading to the public and also training Ceres Victoria in the ways of vampire hunting. Though Ceres Victoria considers Alucard as her master, it's Peter Farguson who is her true mentor. Peter considers Ceres as his daughter and has high regard for her ability to still retain her humanity despite the fact that she's been turned into a vampire. Ceres Victoria received her major vampire hunting skills under the mentorship of Peter Farguson, who was always involved in his operation to give her proper on-ground experience for investigations, risk assessment, attacking, defending and managing dangerous encounters as a team. This is where Peter Farguson figures in as the mentor-type old man supernatural aid for Ceres Victoria. Everyone in the Helsing organization considers Peter Farguson as an equal, even though he's a human commander. This respect is rather achieved by him than merely a formality that comes because of his position in the Helsing organization. This bald military veteran turned Helsing operative is heavily assaulted by Jan Valentine, and it leaves a prominent scar on his face. As for his death, Peter Farguson dies at the hands of the British military during the standoff at the Tower of London. Even though he's killed by a British Army sniper, it's implied that the rest of the British Army soldiers saluted Peter Farguson at the tower as they were themselves not aware if he was to be killed by their own sniper. Peter Farguson makes a huge contribution to the Helsing organization. Not only does he train Ceres Victoria, but he's also been their most loyal and longest-serving human commander who cared for everything that the Helsing organization stood for and everyone in it. His death was a grave loss of Sir Integra and Ceres Victoria, as they were deeply affected by his tragic passing. The nobility of humanity didn't die in vain after all, because the Helsing organization and Ceres were finally able to stop the gruesome Battle of London. Dexter Alfensis No armed conflict-resolving organization works without strong intelligence support from their agents. In the manga, the Helsing organization's chief informant is Dexter Alfensis. Alfensis shares a similar position as Walter, but the only difference is that Walter is Helsing organization's butler and chief weapons designer. As for Dexter Alfensis, he appears as a lanky and harmless aging man whose sole responsibility is to serve Sir Integra as her key informant on all on-ground activities. He keeps the organization updated on the latest threats and also informs on the movements of opposing organizations like the Vatican and the Iscaria. Dexter Alfensis always appears in a black outfit with earphones constantly on his head. Dexter and Walter receive a lot of messages and intel from their allied attaches 
and then deliver them to Sir Integra. Dexter Alfensis is the key informant who gives Sir Integra a heads up about the Iscariot's move to Badrick, around the same time as Alucard and Sarah's Victoria are sent there on a mission. On realizing the threat, Sir Integra asks Dexter about the agent sent by the Iscariot to Badrick, and Dexter reveals that it's Father Alexander Anderson. Sir Integra senses danger in the air, quickly moves to Badrick with the assistance of Dexter Alfensis. Overall, Dexter Alfensis is like a cog in the machine of the Helsing organization and keeps them updated on any intel they need to prepare for threats. Gareth Henderson Gareth Henderson is the in-house morale keeper of the Helsing soldiers in Helsing 2001. He's a kind and caring captain and serves under Peter Ferguson. For on-ground fights, Gareth Henderson leads all of Helsing organization's troops and also constantly oversees their training. He highly respects Sarah's Victoria as a true vampire and tries his best to keep his fellow officers in check to prevent them from disrespecting Ceres Victoria. He also gifts the anti-Midian rifle to Ceres Victoria as he finds it more suitable for her. Gareth Henderson is one of the primary operatives in the initial fight against artificial vampires like Jessica and Leaf. He's faced all the ghouls and the mysterious artificial vampires rising from everywhere in London and is one of Helsing's best agents overall. In episode 3 of Helsing 2001, Gareth was tasked with encountering a freak vampire who had endangered a lot of security and police officers and he led the P7 to neutralize the freak vampire. However, this attack was a failure as all the P7 officers died in an Iscariot ambush. Gareth was shocked but when he tried to act, Father Anderson killed him with a bayonet that split his spine. The passing of Gareth Henderson deeply angered Sir Integra, who broke into a rage when Enrico Maxwell mocked her by bringing up Gareth's death, showing that no matter who served the Helsing organization, Sir Integra cared for everyone equally, especially someone of Gareth Henderson's caliber. Chris Pickman, the true embodiment of a Helsing soldier, fearless, calm, and every bit loyal to the Helsing organization, Chris Pickman became the captain of the special forces of the Helsing organization in the 2001 anime after the attack on the Helsing Manor by the Valentine brothers and the death of another character a bit further down the list. Chris Pickman wears a uniform similar to the other soldiers of the Helsing organization. He's highly respected by Alucard for his fierceness, moral code, and ability to remain calm in even the worst case scenarios. There's another reason for Alucard to call Chris Pickman the true Helsing soldier. As Chris is about to die, he willingly gives up his life to Alucard's Kasul because he wants to die a human. This just bumps up Alucard's respect for him when he sees that Chris Pickman would not choose the immortality of a ghoulish existence, but instead die as he was born, a human. Humans might be the worst monsters in Helsing, but there are many examples of human characters that are supremely moral and noble. They believe in the goodness of humanity and are willing to die for it, like Chris Pickman did. Brian Stedler. Now that we've spoken about noble foot soldiers of the Helsing organization, let's talk about the rat amongst them. Brian Stedler is just an attention-hungry infiltrator in the Helsing organization who simply wants a bigger slice of the pie that will get him the limelight. Stedler doesn't really play any major or even minor role in Helsing. He's always been looking for stardom and fame, like a lowly reporter trying to get his shot to fame by fabricating rumors and fake news. When Brian Stedler joins the Helsing organization to replace Captain Gareth after Father Anderson's attack on him, he simply takes up with the Helsing organization with the hopes of being a hero under the spotlight. However, he's in for a disappointment as he comes to the realization that the Helsing organization doesn't operate in plain sight. The Helsing organization's undercover operations fall against his ambitions to rise up as a prominent figure in London and Britain. Therefore, he tries to expose Helsing organization and its association with vampires like Alucard, but ends up getting taken into custody for it. He's also a sexual predator, as he consistently harassed and also tries to make unwarranted advances at Ceres Victoria, a night before his final exposure and arrest. His punishment by the police, however, remains unstated. Kim Chapman Kim Chapman is another minor character with as small a screen time as Brian Stedler, which is fitting because she was his partner in crime. Kim is essentially a reporter and news anchor who gets alerted about the vampire attacks and sudden appearances of ghouls in London. While trying to investigate the situation, Kim is lured by Brian Stedler with the offer to provide hard evidence from a live location of a vampire attack. This vampire attack location is actually an abandoned room where a human is about to be killed by an artificial vampire for a snuff film on the dark web. Brian and Kim do nothing to stop the recording of this snuff film, but keep watching it to record their evidence live on scene. Alucard finally arrives on the scene, stops the vampire and the snuff film recording, 
and also finds Kim hiding as she watches the crime happen in front of her. When Kim is apprehended and confronted by Sir Integra, Kim states that it's her duty as a journalist to expose the truth to the world, and she was merely doing her job. Sir Integra, on the other hand, claims that Kim's abatement in the recording of a snuff film is a crime that's not fit for the judgment of human laws. So, Sir Integra orders Alucard to drink her blood. Some journalists never have a line they don't cross, do they? Mason Fox Mason Fox is the third person to take up the captain's role for the human fighting squad of Helsing Organization after Brian Stedler's betrayal as a mole and fame-hungry officer. Mason Fox was one of the few soldiers who remained alive after the Valentine Brothers' attack on the Helsing Manor. He was sent with his squad on a separate mission outside the Helsing Manor when that particular attack occurred. He's slightly taller than Cerus Victoria and sports the usual green and brown fighting squad uniform known to be the colors of the Helsing Organization's human fighting troops. As a part of the Helsing Organization's private army, Sir Integra chooses Mason Fox specifically for his expertise in hand-to-hand -hand combat and proficiency in almost every weapon available in the Helsing Organization's arsenal. After his demise, he was replaced by Chris Pickman, who was the final captain of the Helsing Special Forces in the 2001 anime. Harry Anders Harry Anders is an MI5 agent from Helsing 2001 who works in tandem with one of his agents to investigate the freak chip incidents with the Helsing organization. He poses as the lead for this organization and keeps in touch with his agent to understand what this new breed of artificial vampires are like and who's creating them. Harry Anders, along with Cyrus Victoria, had traveled to meet another true vampire in order to understand the situation on hand better, showing his myriad contacts in the world as an MI5 agent. He's claimed that he worked with Cyrus Victoria's father too, which makes her seemingly soften up to him considering her relationship with her own father. But it's widely speculated that Harry Anders makes this claim to make Cyrus Victoria protect him in case of an emergency. Either way, it really doesn't work out for Harry Anders as he dies in a mysterious car explosion with Cyrus bearing witness to the whole thing. Jonathan Parker Jonathan Parker was another minor character that only played a character of formality like a side character usually does. Jonathan Parker has been described as a great man and a very experienced intelligence agent and military man. He's appointed as the lieutenant for the SAS and manages the Babaon Castle operation in Helsing 2001 with an SAS unit being sent to investigate the freak chip. His men end up getting turned into artificial vampires themselves and are later used to battle Alucard and Cerus in the final stages of the anime. Peter Winfield Sir Peter Winfield is a very minor character from Helsing 2001 who appears only in one episode in the series. He's said to be a family member of one of the noble houses of Britain. He's your typical 40 to 50s aged British man with a huge mansion and has a taste for young models. One night after a party, he gets a young model to accompany him to his mansion for obvious reasons. This young model, after reaching his mansion, drops her coat. Overcome with lust, Sir Peter Winfield tries to embrace her. While he's about to live out his fantasy with this young model, they both hear voices from behind a sofa in the room. Sir Peter Winfield is scared about a scandal and demands to know who is hiding behind the sofa. A voice states to him that it's a member of the Royal Order of Religious Knights. Soon, this intruder asks Sir Peter Winfield to run for his life if he doesn't want to turn into a ghoul. Peter Winfield tries to escape, but he trips and falls as the intruder shoots the young model. Sir Peter Winfield realizes to his horror that he was about to sleep with a vampire. And that just about settles his story as he tries to find his savior. But obviously, Sir Peter Winfield never figures out his savior's real identity, and obviously it was Alucard as is usually the case in Helsing. Police Chief Malfa Right when the events of Helsing kick into action, it starts with a mass murder in Birmingham. Police Chief Malfa is appointed as the investigating officer for these murders, and to his utter horror, he realizes that the murders were not of a human nature by a long shot. He notices a pattern in the mass murder of three families. The victims were drained of their blood, and there were bite marks on their necks. This leads Police Chief Malfa to take up the issue with a higher authority that can handle this investigation. He suspects the work of supernatural beings, and he's not wrong. Soon, Sir Integra is asked to intervene and take over the investigation on the Birmingham mass murder case. The Helsing organization makes its very first appearance here, with Sir Integra arriving at the scene as a representative of the Helsing Agency. Police Chief Malfa warns Sir Integra that the murders look like the works of a Bonnie and Clyde duo of unknown criminals. Further, to Sir Integra's annoyance, she discovers that the walls of the murder scene are painted with anti-Christian messages for the Helsing organization. This incident officially kickstarts the Helsing story with its rampant artificial vampire attacks on the streets of London. 
Sir Henry Irons. The first notable member of the Irons family, Sir Henry Irons is the leader of the Round Table organization and the strongest ally of the Helsing organization. However, he has an iron will strong enough to confront Sir Integra for her failure to protect Britain's interests. While the Round Table is happening at the Helsing Manor, the Valentine brothers mount their attack on the manor and Sir Integra assures them that they're safe. However, that proves to be wrong and Jan Valentine is successful in breaking into the room to attack them. Though Jan Valentine is neutralized, his attack leaves a trail of ghouls all across the Helsing Manor made of ex-Helsing soldiers. As a person, Sir Henry Irons has a calm and composed demeanor. He's always cool about any situation, no matter how hot the fire gets. He also orders Sir Integra to take full responsibility for her failure to defend her own manor and for the fall of her soldiers. In many ways, Sir Henry Irons also feels as humiliated as Sir Integra for the fall of the Helsing Manor, as he's been their strongest ally and was close to Sir Integra's family members. Sir Henry Irons is also quite intuitive, as he's the first person to suspect that Walter has been a long-time mole for the Millennium Organization. Sir Henry Irons had warned Walter about Richard Helsing's jealousy toward the young Sir Integra. Sir Henry Irons had suspected that Richard Helsing would try to kill the young Sir Integra to take over the Helsing Organization. He warns Walter to keep a watch over Richard and protect Sir Integra, but on the night of the attack on the young Integra, Walter was missing the entire time. This confirmed Sir Henry Irons' suspicion that Walter had been betraying the Helsing organization since the start of his World War II days. Quite the intuitive knight Sir Henry Irons was. Henry Irons IV, second in the Irons family with a major place in Britain and an alliance with the Helsing organization, is the great-grandson of Sir Henry Irons, Henry Irons IV. He's a member of the Convention of Twelve, as he replaced his great-grandfather, Sir Irons. He shares a lot of physical and facial similarities to his great-grandfather. Though he plays no role in the main events of Helsing, he makes an appearance in the epilogue of Helsing to show that his family continues to be an ally of Sir Integra and the Helsing organization. He has an iron resolve that, should the artificial vampiric attacks and the Millennium resurface to attack Britain again, Sir Henry Irons IV will keep up his family's legacy as the ally and protector of Britain's interest to keep its people safe at all costs. Sir Shelby Penwood Sir Shelby Penwood was really a character of contrast. As contrasts go, Sir Penwood was initially a very cowardly knight of the Round Table. He'd often get into fits of panic every time he felt he was in danger. While the Round Table is ongoing, the Valentine brothers attack the Helsing Manor, and soon Sir Penwood is left in splits, as he's afraid of dying. But all that his cowardly personality has to offer changes as the Battle of London unravels. Sir Shelby Penwood goes from being a scared knight to leading his men bravely to trap Millennium's artificial vampires in his own base. As the artificial vampires are trapped in the base, Sir Shelby Penwood sacrifices himself by exploding his base. As a last effort to save his officers, Sir Shelby Penwood orders his men to leave the base and escape with their lives. But inspired by his heroic bravery and courage, his soldiers don't leave the base and stay for one last fight. That's how the story of Sir Shelby Penwood ends as he explodes his base and traps a horde of artificial vampires of the Millennium Organization. His final moments are etched into fictional history as Penwood's last stand. Sir Integra, who initially thought Penwood was as weak as her peers did, changed her opinion of him because of this event and became a champion of his legacy in her final years. Sir Gregory Penwood Sir Gregory Penwood is the grandson of Sir Shelby Penwood. He has a very small role in closing the chapter of the Helsing series on a similar note as Sir Henry Irons IV. Much like Sir Irons IV, Sir Gregory Penwood pledges a lifelong allegiance to Sir Integra post the aftermath of the attack on London. Unlike his grandfather, Sir Gregory Penwood is much braver and has an air of confidence around him. He's proud to share the legacy of his grandfather by continuing to be an ally for the Helsing organization, much like his friend Sir Henry Irons IV. But he also shares the nervousness quirk that is the Penwood trademark left behind by his grandfather, and Integra hasn't stopped bullying the Penwood family with her insane requests even 30 years after the attack on London, which continues a harrowing family tradition. Rob Walsh Along with the previous two characters we just discussed that closed the Helsing series, Rob Walsh is another one of them. Rob Walsh is a British Army officer and assumes his role as a member of the Convention of Twelve that aids the Helsing organization as its ally. Rob Walsh is also the Roundtable Councillor Lieutenant General and leads Britain's allegiance with the Helsing organization post the 30-year gap following the end of the Battle of London. The Queen 
The Queen only makes a minor appearance in the Helsing series and isn't revealed for her physical appearance as much for her commanding position in the Round Table Council. The Queen just decided to take cognizance of the threat of artificial vampires ravaging London and to ensure that she personally understands the gravity of the situation. She heads the Round Table Council. However, this meeting reveals that the Queen and Alucard have known each other since the World War era days, and they have a highly respectful and loving friendship with each other. But this reunion is interrupted by the Millennium as the Major delivers his speech about an incoming war on London. To this, the Queen simply orders Alucard and the Helsing organization to destroy them. In the 2001 anime, things shake out a bit differently as Helsing gets branded as traitors by the end and the Queen personally orders a hit on each of their members. But we're sure that most of the Helsing community prefers the woman Alucard thinks has aged beautifully compared to the one that tried to have his master killed. Abraham Van Helsing Apart from Alucard, if there's anyone who started the whole vampire murder mission first, then that's Abraham Van Helsing. The patron of the Helsing organization and an ace genius, Abraham Van Helsing was the first to realize the existence of vampires. Most people of his time believed him to be crazy, but this highly educated and distinguished polymath saw Count Dracula coming way before anyone else. Abraham Van Helsing is therefore the first arch-nemesis of Alucard and the only human who was strong enough to make Alucard bleed with his punch. So that proves how unbelievably strong Abraham Van Helsing was on his own. He had an open mind for everything, despite being a scientist. It is this open mind that sparked his interest in mastering occult knowledge and soon led to discovering the existence of Alucard or Count Dracula. Realizing the threat that Alucard posed to humanity, Abraham Van Helsing made it his life's mission to kill Alucard and subsequently set up the now-existing Helsing organization. Sir Integra is his great-granddaughter and a fierce believer in the mission of her ancestors. The appearance of Abraham Van Helsing is minor in the series, and his dressing usually keeps changing throughout the storyline. Overall, he appears as a strong-bodied male with a rectangular face and a stubble beard, a man with an unrivaled genius. Alucard in the present storyline still considers that Abraham Van Helsing can never be matched for his humanity, fearlessness, and the sheer will to subdue him as a servant of the Helsing organization. Oh, it's like they say, great power comes great responsibility. Uncle Ben definitely read Bram Stoker's Dracula as a kid. Arthur Helsing The patriarch of the Helsing house after Abraham Van Helsing is his son, Arthur Helsing. He was active as the head of the Helsing organization during World War II, at which time he deployed Walter C. Dornes and Alucard to combat Millennium when it was just starting out. He had such supreme faith in his men that he didn't even bother checking in with them, which probably was a bad idea considering Millennium ended up surviving into his daughter's era, but chalk it up to cocky bravado on a wartime general's part. Arthur plays a major role in the inheritance of the Helsing organization by Sir Integra. Arthur was every bit the man his father Abraham Van Helsing was. He believed in his family's mission to protect humanity from rogue vampires and supernatural beings. Arthur also knew Alucard well, and it's stated that he renamed him as Alucard from the original name Dracula. Arthur appears as an old man fighting a fatal disease but still commanding the Helsing organization. Just before his death, his younger brother Richard expected that he would inherit the power of the Helsing family. But contrary to his belief, Arthur Van Helsing had a girl child with a woman of Indian origins. Not much is known about this Indian woman and that she's Sir Integra's mother is the best known fact about her. Sir Integra seems to have inherited most of her looks from her mother instead of her father. But Alucard often points out that her spirit and willpower have a strong resemblance to his earlier master, Arthur. Alucard sees a lot of Arthur in Sir Integra. In fact, a good amount of loyalty comes from Alucard's realization that he was set free from the dungeon because Arthur Van Helsing pointed the little girl Integra towards him as a last resort from her uncle's hunt. Arthur Van Helsing is a very wise man for his age and having protected Britain for decades with the Helsing organization, his experience and knowledge about the whole vampire affair is expansive. He's also wise enough to realize that passing on the Helsing organization to his young daughter will invite his brother Richard's anger and lead him to plot murder against Integra to secure the Helsing Manor. Before his death, Arthur does a fine job of training Integra to be the future matriarch of the Helsing family. He takes lessons with her, trains her, and has a strict code for punctuality that later becomes a hallmark of Sir Integra's work ethic. Arthur entrusts his little daughter's safety to Walter as he expects an attack on her from his brother Richard Van Helsing. However, Walter is absent on that night after Arthur's death and Sir Integra is attacked by Richard. As her last resort to safety, she recollects the direction of a forgotten dungeon that her father had pointed to use when she would find herself defenseless and alone. This is how Sir Integra finds a corpse like hibernating Alucard while escaping from her uncle Richard and his soldiers. Much to Richard's surprise, he was always kept in the dark by Arthur about the dungeon and the existence of Alucard inside it. 
And that pretty much seals his fate, as he makes the mistake of shooting young Integra. Voila! That's how Alucard comes back to life when Integra's blood is spilled on Alucard. Now you know what a blood-drained and hibernating Alucard would do after he's revived. Right. Richard Helsing. Family heritage is something you can't pass off or give up in a story like Helsing, when the whole premise involves a legendary vampire hunting family. The Helsing organization was set up by its founder and the world's first human vampire hunter, Abraham Van Helsing. After Abraham Van Helsing, his son and Sir Integra's father, Arthur, takes the seat of the Helsing Manor as its head and chief of operations. This is a position that Arthur's brother Richard Helsing has long coveted to secure a place in the Convention of the Twelve as a powerful man in Britain's politics. But, much to his disappointment, a young Sir Integra is instead chosen as the new heir of the Helsing seat. Richard takes this as an insult and launches a hunt to kill her. Integra runs toward the dungeon that her father Arthur tells her about. She runs to the dungeon with the hope of hiding. What she finds in the dungeon is actually Alucard's half-dead body. Richard shoots a young Integra and the bullet hits her arm and spills her blood on Alucard. She becomes the reason for Alucard's resurrection, and as a favor, Alucard kills Sir Integra's cowardly uncle and his officers. Ultimately, Richard Helsing doesn't gain anything, but only revives the first true vampire who pledges his allegiance to the new heir of Helsing. When a young Integra shoots down Richard to kill him, this confirms in Alucard's mind that he's found a worthy master. <laughs> what a way to go, Richard! Cheddar Priest One of the first minor antagonists of Helsing, the Cheddar Priest is a vampire who's also known as the Lone Pastor. He was the priest in charge of the small village of Cheddar and would be rarely seen outside his quarters in the day. He would only come out on overcast days and his first victim was a teenage boy, but the body count kept increasing steadily. After this Lone Pastor had killed ten people in his village, they all went missing and this prompted the action of the police. Only they made the mistake of discovering the blood-soaked pastor inside his church at night and were attacked by the vampire in the darkness. Soon after this incident, the Helsing organization got involved and sent Alucard on an investigation to the Lone Pastor's village. Upon reaching there, Alucard found out that the priest had ambushed Ceres Victoria, who was working with the London Police Department. Needless to say, the priest tried to use Ceres Victoria as a human shield against Alucard. It's implied that the priest desired to make Ceres his vampire slave, but that didn't pan out exactly like he wanted. Alucard killed him with a bullet and put an end to his ghoul army before its population could explode. Whether the Cheddar Priest was an artificial vampire or a true one is still a debate, as the priest has claimed he can create true vampires with his bite. This doesn't happen with artificial vampires, but when the priest dies, he's engulfed in blue flames in a similar manner as Millennium's other artificial vampires. So, it's all uncertain about what kind of vampire the Treader Priest was. What is certain is that he was one creepy bugger, and the perfect introductory villain to a franchise like Helsing. Leaf. Leaf is the first half of the Bonnie and Clyde type artificial vampire duo. They're very weak compared to Luke Valentine or the other artificial vampires created by the Millennium, but they're powerful nevertheless, even when they just go on an arrogant killing spree. Their confidence in their newfound vampiric abilities is blindly optimistic. Leaf, much like Jessica, is drunk on pride and power when they're turned into artificial vampires by millennia. Though they think that they're now the most powerful beings who can paint the town red, this duo of artificial vampires is just a test sample for Millennium. As stated before, they're perhaps Millennium's weakest artificial vampires and need a gun to keep fighting. Their abilities alone are not good enough. They have an unexplained obsession with committing 13 murders and believe that once they finish killing 13 victims, they'll finally become invincible and immortal. Their favorite mark to leave behind is to write profane statements on the walls of their crime scene, and it really pisses off the staunch Protestant in Sir Integra. Alucard, on the other hand, finds Leaf to be a low-life pest and kills him without much of a fuss. As stupid as they are, their arrogance in leaving behind bodies is what ends up putting them in Helsing's crosshairs. This body count then starts turning into ghouls, which Helsing can easily track. If it wasn't for Leaf kickstarting the story with Jessica as a serial killer vampire, Helsing probably wouldn't have figured out that artificial vampires exist and someone is playing a long game. Jessica, the better half of Leaf, Jessica is just as weak and foolish as him. She's a predator who enjoys killing her victims and flaunts it without remorse. Jessica has the same vampiric super strength as Leaf, which is just above basic human powers. Along with Leaf, her chief mission is to spread terror across the streets of London by committing mass murders and creating ghouls that will create more panic. Enough panic getting out of hand will force the Helsing organization to come out of their shadows to take charge of the situation. However, the key personality traits shared by the duo are their arrogance and stupidity in covering their tracks. 
which leaves them wide open to retaliation from Helsing. They do it rather easily by sending Alucard and Ceres Victoria to kill both Jessica and Leaf. Alucard kills Leaf and Ceres kills Jessica from a long distance without needing the aid of a telescopic sight, as she's a vampire now. Paul Wilson When Incognito set out on his mission to use his freak chip in Helsing 2001, he trapped the British forces into believing that there was a dangerous terrorist waiting to attack them. The British government sent a force of SAS agents to confront Incognito in his tower, but that was just the trap he wanted to set off to create his brand of artificial vampires. Incognito captured numerous SAS agents and one of them was the young Paul Wilson. Paul was converted into an artificial vampire stronger than others that Incognito created with his perverted chips. Paul was implanted with numerous chips throughout his body and gained more powers than the average freak vampires. He has the same relationship with Incognito like Ceres Victoria has with Alucard, a fledgling. Paul is manipulative and sadistic. He tries to use his mind control and illusion powers to trap Ceres Victoria in a dream. He tries to convince her to join Incognito and his army of freak vampires but fails to do so. Instead, Ceres slams incendiary napalm rounds into Paul's neck and tears through it. Paul serves as both a foil to Ceres Victoria and also another one of the characters who has an obsessive infatuation for her. He tries to contact and telepathically manipulate Ceres Victoria to join his team. Speaking of telepathy, Paul Wilson is also the only artificial vampire in Helsing 2001 who can use telepathy and his powers are on an equal level as the Valentine brothers. He can also turn into a hideous bat-like creature at will, but this transformation can be interrupted by shoving napalm down his throat which is what we've already told you guys. Overall, he has the same lack of dignity and sadistic sensibilities as Valentine Brothers or the other artificial vampires in Helsing who love the idea of being drunk on power. Incognito couldn't pick a better right-hand man for himself than Paul Wilson, <laughs> and that's a fact. Enrico Stivaletti Another one of the minor characters in Helsing 2001, Enrico Stivaletti has perhaps the shortest role to play in the storyline. He's an exchange student who's turned into an artificial vampire and tries to convert another boy in his hostel into an artificial vampire. Enrico wants to be with Mick forever and tries to make a vampire out of him. The boy Mick, however, dies and he's implied to be Enrico's romantic partner. When he fails, Enrico is apprehended to be sent into the morgue with his artificial vampire chip removed. He's believed to be dead, but he comes back to life and tries to find Mick again. But before that, he arms himself heavily and starts slaughtering the mortuary staff and turns them into ghouls. He was first meant to be apprehended by the Helsing Organization's special military team, but they're delayed and the paladin father Alexander Anderson intervenes to kill Enrico. However, the paladin doesn't get this artificial vampire on his kill list as Alucard intervenes and kills him before the paladin could make a good move. Yep. Enrico is a very minor character indeed, but he serves as the reason behind Anderson's arrival in Britain in Helsing 2001, as opposed to the vague bardic incident from the manga and the OVA series. Helena, let's just say that not all vampires in the Helsing franchise are demonic. Case in point, Ceres Victoria, but also Helena, from Studio Gonzo's version of Helsing. She's a true vampire along the same lines as Alucard, but she has no interest whatsoever in being a typical vampire. Her origins are shrouded in mystery and she usually appears as a child. This implies that Helena has been a vampire since her childhood. As for her real age, she's over 500 years old. Helena has been shown as the only vampire who lives in seclusion and doesn't attack humans. This is the reason why the Helsing organization doesn't consider Helena a threat and just leaves her alone. She prefers her solitude and lives in an archaic home with no electronic devices or amenities. Helena harbors hope for humankind and wishes that she was human too. She's practically tired of immortality and wishes to die like a human. But Helena poses a major threat to the plans of another true vampire you'll meet soon enough. While Ceres Victoria comes to visit Helena, this true vampire has already arrived at Helena's home to kill her. It's too late for Ceres Victoria to save Helena, as her killer starts devouring her in his last attempt to kill her. Helena does manage to escape from him, but she's severely decapitated. Ceres Victoria is left with nothing but to promise Helena that she'll help Alucard stop him and she'll always have faith in humanity. Sadly, Ceres mourns the passing of a noble-spirited true vampire alone as Helena uses her pyrokinesis to burn herself with her home. Helena has all the true vampire powers, but some more. She has telekinetic abilities, mind-reading powers, pyrokinesis, and can easily manipulate wind. But she only uses her pyrokinesis in the end to embrace death as she says goodbye to Ceres Victoria. Helena is finally relieved that her immortality has come to an end. The goodness of Helena is something you'll never forget after you're done watching Helsing 01. She's really the exception amongst all the monsters in the Helsing canon. 
incognito. There's an unexplained dispute in the Helsing canon on who exactly is the first true vampire. Yes, we know we've been always saying that Alucard is the first true vampire, but Kota Hirano also tells us that it might be really not that easy to point out who exactly is the first real vampire in Helsing. The person to create this dispute is incognito. He's a true vampire like Alucard and as good as him, but his origin comes from Africa and it's often referred to as the Dark Continent. He's one of Alucard's most deadly enemies like Father Alexander Anderson. Incognito is an expert in dark magic and also the creator of the Freak Chip in Helsing 2001, which he later uses to create his own army of artificial vampires from the SAS regiment officers he traps in his Tower of Operations. He serves an unnamed master and is very loyal to him. He uses the SAS officer Paul Wilson as his bodyguard and servant. Their relationship dynamic is the same as Alucard and Ceres Victoria. He's androgynous in his appearance with purplish-gray skin and is totally bald. His eyes are of uneven sizes and one of them is distorted. As for his arms, even they are of uneven sizes. He has cryptic tattoos over his body and piercings on his face. He can also summon ancient gods to fight in his place through the use of his dark magic. Incognito is a masochistic and sadistic vampire and has no guilt for any killings he undertakes or the countless artificial vampires he creates for an unnamed mission under the commands of an unknown master. He's also a great tactician who's able to outsmart Sir Integra. He and the Major of the Millennium share quite the same philosophy of life. Kill or be killed. Destroy the world until it's back to ashes. Incognito sets out on his version of the Major's mission by first hunting down the hiding vampire Helena as he considers her as a potential threat to his mission. Next, he arrives in London to take over a tower and tips off the British government about an imminent terrorist attack. The Helsing organization is warned by the British government to not interfere in the SAS's regiment's attempt to take down the so-called terrorist, but all of it proves to be a trap for the SAS regiment as Incognito proceeds to fight and take over the soldiers for his own freak vampire army. Paul Wilson ends up becoming Incognito's servant, and the rest of the SAS officers are spiked up with the freak chip. Alucard and Ceres Victoria then battle this army of artificial vampires as Incognito starts preparing for the final showdown. Incognito has a thing for pain. He loves enduring and experiencing pain like you would enjoy a good massage. Unlike others who flinch at the feeling of pain in Helsing, Incognito smiles and laughs because he enjoys pain. Alucard even mocks Incognito before his death by threatening to send Incognito to the deepest pit in hell, where he can lick Satan's ass and enjoy his eternal pain with ease. But for his superior powers, Incognito's weakness is his arrogance and self-confidence. His arrogance leads him to ignore his enemies once he's convinced they're dead, as is the case when he assumes Alucard is dead and leaves the battlefield. Another instance is when he assumes Ceres Victoria would bleed to death, but she gets back alive for good. Ultimately, this arrogance is precisely why Incognito dies as Alucard comes back to finish his job and hang Incognito's corpse over the top of the cathedral where the two oldest vampires were having their final face-off. Set With a master plan to rival the Millennium, Incognito sets out to unleash the ancient god Set over London from the tower of his operations. This happens after Incognito's human ritual with a body is complete, which in the case of this demonic summoning happened to be Integris. But don't worry guys, <laughs> she survives. Set starts attacking London as a white silvery flash of lightning and destroys anything and everyone coming in its way as it runs havoc all around. However, Set isn't able to do his best in London as he's soon summoned by Incognito to aid him in his fight against Alucard. Set does give Alucard a good fight, but not enough to kill him. Instead, Set joins Alucard and gets fused into his jackal to become the final bullet that impales and kills Incognito. This is one comeback of Alucard that's definitely on top of all his other Helsing comebacks. Since Incognito is referred to in Helsing as a vampire from the Dark Continent, it's most likely that Set here refers to the Egyptian god Set, reworked to fit the context of Helsing 2001. Still, beating your enemy by stealing their swag? Now, that's why Alucard is the OG vampire, ladies and gentlemen. The Pope. The Pope was a minor character in the Helsing storyline and only makes brief appearances as the head of the Roman Catholic Church in the Vatican. He commands all societies related to the Vatican, like the secret Vatican Chapter 13, Iscaria. Both Father Alexander Anderson and Enrico Maxwell work for the Pope and follow his orders. Well, maybe not every time, but yeah, the Pope's their godfather. <laughs> and once again intended. For all intents and purposes, no one in the Vatican family will dare go against the Pope, much like no one in Britain will go against the Queen. But that's not really the case most of the time. Our lead characters just improvise on their whims when it comes down to the real fight, so the Pope mostly stays in the background of all affairs in his Vatican citadel.
Heinkel Wolf. Heinkel Wolf is one of the killing machines of the Iscariot who was blind faith in Enrico Maxwell. As part of the foot soldiers of Iscariot, Heinkel Wolf appears as an androgynous personality but is mostly referred to as a female. She wears the priest uniform of the Iscariot organization and prefers two pistols as her choice of weapon. She shares a close friendship with Yumiko Takagi and they're usually seen in the series together to carry out the Vatican's Ninth Crusade against the heathens during the Battle of London. As for her allegiance, it lies more with Enrico Maxwell than with Father Alexander Anderson. She's as blinded about gaining greater glory as Enrico Maxwell. She also acts as a bodyguard for Enrico Maxwell along with Yumiko Takagi. Heinkel Wolf has huge anger issues every time Father Anderson goes against the orders of Enrico Maxwell, but at the same time, she respects Father Anderson with the respect of a mentor. Heinken Wolf was also present during the Round Table Council when Schrodinger appeared out of nowhere and she pointed her pistols at him. During the Ninth Crusade, Father Anderson orders Heinkel and Yumiko to leave for Rome, but they disobey his orders to stay back and fight. After the death of Father Anderson and the resurfacing of Walter as a traitor to the Helsing organization, Heinkel is deeply affected by Walter's disrespect for the dead paladin. Heinkel Wolf tries to intervene, but is warned by the captain to not step in with a shot of a bullet that goes in and out of Heinkel's cheeks. Heinkel Wolf at this point has lost both Father Alexander Anderson and her friend and co-fighter Yumiko Takagi, but by now even she realizes that she's out of her league to fight the remaining vampires like Alucard, Ceres Victoria or Walter. Eventually, when Walter tries to celebrate his supposed victory over Alucard, Heinkel Wolf sees this as her opportunity to exact revenge. But even though she's a regenerator similar to Father Alexander, Heinkel Wolf is torn apart with Walter's microfilament wires. Thirty years after the Battle of London, Heinkel Wolf is seen again but in her older form with a limb still in place on her body. It's not revealed if they're her own limbs or just prosthesis. Overall, she's very similar to her commanding Archbishop Enrico Maxwell, just another rebel without a cause, but with a lot of blind faith in fighting for God's glory. Yumiko Yumi Takagi Yumiko Yumi Takagi is another one of Father Alexander Anderson's wards from his orphanage back in the Vatican. She's a nun and has a split personality disorder. As a fellow mate of Heinkel Wolf, the two share a fierce loyalty and friendship for each other. But more than Father Anderson, Yumiko follows Enrico Maxwell as he becomes the head of the Iscariot. Due to her split personality, she's often switching personalities between Yumiko and Yumi. On the one hand, she can be the gentle, caring and peace-loving nun, Yumiko. Then, upon being commanded to go to sleep and let Yumi awake, she could completely switch it for Yumi, the katana-wielding death machine whose fury and bloodlust have no end. She performs a similar role as Heinkel Wolf does during the Battle of London. Both Yumi and Heinkel are constantly angry when Father Anderson helps Sir Integra simply because Sir Integra is a Protestant enemy of the Vatican. However, Yumi is forced to be Sir Integra's escort back to her manor. There are multiple instances when Yumi loses her patience and wants to chop Sir Integra in half, but she can be subdued by her friend Heinkel. Along with Heinkel, Yumi disobeys Father Anderson's orders to leave for Rome and continue to fight with the Vatican's forces. However, as Father Anderson died after his final face-off, Yumi is enraged by Walter's disrespect of her dead paladin mentor. She tries to fight Walter and meets her death at the grasp of his microfilament wires. Yumi's death goes down as the most merciless, gruesome and bloody death in the Helsing series, leaving Heinkel as the only survivor of the Battle of London on the Iscariot side. Makube. Makube is another minor character in the Helsing storyline and is one of the characters introduced to give a sense of continuity to the Helsing story when it reaches its end. Toward the end of the story, a revenge-seeking Heinkel Wolf suggests to this newly appointed head of Iscariot to kill half the round table at the cost of their own lives. But Makube is much saner and level-headed than his predecessor Enrico Maxwell, simply asks Heinkel Wolf to put that thought aside. He suggests to her that the Vatican will rise for its Tenth Crusade, even if it takes more than centuries to do so, but this Tenth Crusade will be won by the Vatican only. In the closing chapter of Helsing, Makube visits Sir Integra at the end of her fencing with Sir Gregory Penwood by mocking her for Helsing organization's lack of hospitality towards the Iscariots waiting to meet her. Sir Integra, on the other hand, sends him back to his waiting lounge and returns his insult by saying that he'll get to meet her when she summons him. We bet that was one cold burn Makube will need more than a century to recover from. Ronaldo. Ronaldo is the muscle to Enrico Maxwell, just as Walter was to Sir Integra. Ronaldo shares Enrico Maxwell's fanatical devotion and mission toward establishing a world for Roman Catholics only. But Ronaldo serves more of a second-in-command role in the series for Iscariot. He's more of a taskmaster that carries out the Iscariot's activities and, by extension, Enrico Maxwell's orders. He makes two prominent appearances. 
The first is when he escorts Enrico Maxwell to meet Sir Integra at the London Imperial War Museum to discuss the Millennium issue. The second is when he appears to represent Iscariot along with Enrico Maxwell at the Round Table Council to meet the Queen. But the meeting is interrupted by Schrodinger appearing out of nowhere with the Major's message. Ronaldo sports a sword as a weapon, but he never uses it except to brandish its hilt a couple of times. Even though Ronaldo is Enrico Maxwell's muscle, he doesn't really show much of his fighting skills throughout Helsing and is presumed dead of natural causes by the end of the series. Father Alexander Anderson The only human that can match up to Alucard or go down blazing an army of monsters without a scratch, Father Alexander Anderson is a rare exception in the Helsing canon. He's proud of his humanity, but more than just proud of his Christianity. Aptly called the Monster of God in Helsing, this ruthless Catholic priest is a zealot of the highest degree and is sent straight from the Vatican and Iscariot with only one mission, kill all monsters on earth or just die trying. Father Alexander Anderson appears as a cunning priest and is a regenerator human being who can regenerate himself from fatal wounds like Alucard and faster than the first true vampire himself. Even Alucard's Kassul could rarely make a dent on Father Anderson's forehead at point-blank range to prove that Father Anderson has perhaps the most powerful regeneration capabilities in Helsing. An arch-nemesis for Alucard, Father Anderson has a deep hatred for all non-believers of Roman Catholicism, Protestants like Sir Integra, and every possible monster you can imagine. He's very instrumental in the fight against artificial vampires and eventually also plays an important role in ending Millennium's attack on London. But Father Anderson has a very twisted and complicated character. On the one hand, he's proud of his Catholicism and identity as a human being, but in the end he converts himself into a monster just to settle his score with Alucard forever. He considers himself human and yet he has no mercy and revels in his killing sprees. Sure, he has principles that don't involve killing any innocent humans but only monsters, but he harbors a deep hatred for any human being who doesn't believe in the Vatican's version of Christianity. He's a loyal-to-death servant of the Vatican and has some pretty cool tricks up his sleeves. He can easily create protection fields with Bible pages that he nails to the walls out of nowhere, and even true vampires can have a hard time getting to him when the shield is in full effect. Father Anderson often appears in an overlong white turncoat and has a limitless supply of bladed weapons that he can simply materialize out of his coats. He also uses an improvised version of the Austrian bayonet that has a firmer grip. These bayonets could extinguish almost any monster and definitely all artificial vampires. Overall, Father Alexander Anderson stands tall as the archenemy and polar opposite of Alucard and gains his respect. Alucard considers Father Anderson as his only equal and the only opponent to die at the hands of. However, it really doesn't work out as planned because Father Anderson eventually uses the nail of Helena and that's like a huge turn off for Alucard because he thinks Father Anderson just put all his efforts of monster killing to waste by becoming a monster himself. With the use of the nail of Helena, Father Anderson fell in the eyes of his oldest vampire archenemy. Regardless of falling in the eyes of Alucard in the end, Father Anderson is a really complex character with a twisted morality, ethics, and blinding loyalty to the Vatican that goes a long way in helping the Helsing organization hold the fort for London till the very end of the Helsing series. Father Alexander Anderson is definitely the best type of anti-hero, the kind you love to hate but also can't resist getting invested in. Because under all his ruthlessness, the paladin is also the caretaker of an orphanage. Just in case you were looking for some saving graces to love this inhuman killing machine of a priest. Enrico Maxwell Monsters just don't exist on the side of hell, demons or the stereotypical bad side. They also exist in the shadow of goodness. Enrico Maxwell might claim himself to be a man of God on a mission to kill all unholy creatures and unbelievers of Roman Catholicism, but he's nothing less than a monster himself. He's essentially the first major orphan pupil of Father Alexander Anderson, but he soon overtakes the ranks of Father Anderson to become the leader of Iscariot. Maxwell is a power-hungry Iscariot leader who has no other agenda than to prove himself as the best man in the Vatican. His excuse to prove his greatness often takes the form of anger and hatred for Protestants and the Helsing organization. He also harbors a hatred for immortality and monsters, which goes without saying as Enrico Maxwell considers them an insult to the gift of mortality given to mankind by God. Soon after becoming an archbishop, Enrico Maxwell turns into a power-drunk Vatican superior who soon tries to play around with Father Anderson's missions. The Vatican and Iscariot on multiple occasions task Enrico with reducing damage or avoiding bloodshed between vampires and humans. Instead, Maxwell uses this as an opportunity to keep leading the Vatican forces on his own crusade. The first proof of this is when Tubal Cain Alhambra is sent to Brazil to kill Alucard. As a result of this face-off, countless military policemen and other casualties take place. 
while Father Anderson watches the aftermath in horror, Enrico Maxwell enjoys this spectacle as he considers it the purging of demons and unholy non-believers. Father Anderson is visibly disturbed and disgusted by Enrico Maxwell's apathy on the situation and soon starts doubting Enrico. As for the later events of Helsing, the Millennium's attack on London is another opportunity that Enrico Maxwell uses to launch his own version of the Crusade. Following the attack on London, the Vatican again trusts Enrico Maxwell to lead their papal knights and soldiers on the Ninth Crusade against the Millennium. With so much power in hand and a promotion to the post of Archbishop by the Pope, Enrico unleashes the full force of the Vatican on London. He changes the Vatican's crusade mission to order the papal knights to kill all vampires and Protestants. Ultimately, Enrico Maxwell realizes that he sorely underestimated Alucard and starts believing that Alucard is the first vampire Dracula himself. By now, Father Anderson is totally done with his pupil's madness and doesn't come to Enrico's defense as Alucard unleashes his familiars to kill Enrico. Enrico Maxwell dies a disgraceful death and finally falls in the eyes of his warden Father Anderson, who calls him a spineless coward. Tubalcane Alhambra Well, Helsing has no shortage of suave, smooth-talking badass characters. If you consider Alucard to be the honest version of smooth-talking monsters, Tubalcane Alhambra is the dishonest version of these slick, suit- and glove-wearing vampires. Tubalcane Alhambra is in the same ranks as Rip Van Winkle and Zorin Blitz. He primarily works as an assassin for Millennium and is sent by the Major to assassinate Alucard in Brazil. Just like his razor-sharp cards, Tubalcane Alhambra has no shortage of sharp lies. To carry out his assassination, he promises military policemen immortality if they execute Alucard. Falling for the false promise of being turned into artificial vampires, army of military policemen assist the dandy man in draining and damaging Alucard in his hotel. Tubalcane Alhambra is well aware that he's comparatively very weak and tries to drain Alucard of his powers in the hotel lobbies. This is simply his tactic to fight a less powerful Alucard and finish the job, but don't let that fool you. Even the cautious Alhambra is very proud of his style, powers and smooth-talking antics. Instead of finishing the job straight away as most assassins do, Tubalcane likes to play around with his enemies. He just talks too much especially tiring his enemies with his lies and not realizing that people don't really talk so much in a fight. But Tubalcane Alhambra likes to use this tactic to fight with his razor-sharp playing cards that can cut through almost anything. While annoying Alucard with his suave conversation, Tubalcane Alhambra consistently alternates into showering Alucard with a flurry of his weaponized playing cards. Finally, the Major commands Tubalcane Alhambra to finish the fight and kill Alucard. But as fights with Alucard go, Tubalcane Alhambra doesn't really match up and finally falls prey to Alucard's bite. Alucard mocks Tubalcane Alhambra by saying that he has orders from the Helsing organization to thoroughly interrogate Tubalcane. That's nothing but a code name to bite Tubalcane Alhambra and peep into his soul for all the information needed on the Millennium organization. Lesson? Smooth talks lead to a dead corpse. So, avoid them in a fight. Rip Van Winkle As the sharpshooter for the Millennium, Rip Van Winkle is aptly named as the Huntress. She is a member of the Werewolf Special Forces of Millennium. Dressed in a sharp cobalt bluish suit with long and flowing hair, she's the stuff of envy for any girl. A woman of style and precision, Rip Van Winkle is just as fanatical about the Millennium agenda and the Major as Zorin Blitz or the Doctor. Suffice to say, her ruthless methods follow in the footsteps of the style of hunting gimmicks of an infamous German folklore persona. Rip Van Winkle has been fascinated by a German folklore persona since the start, and the story says that you can actually trade your soul with the devil for a set of seven magical bullets that can kill or do anything you want. Unfortunately, the seventh bullet is controlled by the devil himself, and the owner is unaware of this fact, which will ultimately bring his or her death. Looking at Rip Van Winkle, you can see how this German folklore is intelligently crafted into her character by Kota Hirano. It's so subtle, it only tells you the kind of in-depth groundwork Kota Hirano has done on every single character of Helsing. Rip Van Winkle's storyline follows a similar arc, her favorite weapon of choice is the long-barreled flintlock musket, similar to what most hunters in pre-World War eras carried for a hunt. Secondly, her favorite bullets are not yet average bullets. She uses magical bullets that can just about pierce anything, even the Mach 3 Blackbird, and they can also change their trajectories to find and kill their targets. Just like heat signature missiles that don't give up on your jet until they blast you into pieces, Rip's bullets will find you and rip you apart. And interestingly enough, Rip is only shown using exactly seven of these magical bullets in Helsing. She uses five to neutralize enemies, helicopters, and missiles. Then the last one is shot at Alucard before her death. 
It does inflict severe damage on Alucard, but just not enough to kill him. But hey, she successfully completes her mission. Much like the devil in the German law kills the magic bullet's owner, it's the Major here who plays the role of the devil. It's uncertain if the Major is the provider of Rip Van Winkle's magical bullets, but the end of the story and death can't excuse the speculation. Her mission was always to distract Alucard away from London and take him across the sea. Rip Van Winkle was supposed to lead Alucard to the sea and keep him stranded in the middle of nowhere. Once her mission is done, the Major sends Schrodinger as his messenger to bid her goodbye with a salute. She's just left to die at the mercy of Alucard and isn't really given any backup or reconnaissance that could rescue her. The Major indeed plays the devil's role to leave Rip Van Winkle alone with Alucard and face her death in exchange for her role as the Huntress with seven magical bullets. We should never meet our heroes. Never. Luke Valentine The higher of the Valentine brothers and definitely the smarter and more practical one, Luke Valentine is the first primary puppet doing the Millennium's work of terrorizing the streets of London with ghouls and artificial vampires. Operating out of a strip club, Luke Valentine is pretty calculating for his experience as an artificial vampire. He's very vigilant and is always careful about who he really turns into an artificial vampire for the Millennium. As far as the Valentine brothers' operation is concerned, Luke Valentine is the brains behind the assault and Jan is the muscle. Luke Valentine, however, shared the same arrogance as Jan, but in a different way. Luke Valentine's arrogance stems from his pride that he'll be the one to kill Alucard and prove that immortality is the myth. There's no saying where exactly Luke Valentine gets his blind optimism from, but it's pretty evident that he trusts the artificial vampire chip more than he should. That way, Luke Valentine's arrogance looks more of a joke than his brother Jan's. At least Jan didn't have the illusion that he was fighting to kill the most indestructible character of Helsing. He was just there to get the kicks, and he did it by flashing the middle finger on Sir Integra in her own manner. But Luke Valentine, for all his calmness and optimism, has really shown his place by Alucard in their face-off in the Helsing manner. At first, the combined elegance and confidence of Luke Valentine's appearance as an enhanced, well-suited artificial vampire really makes an impression on Alucard. But when Alucard sees Luke struggle to just regenerate, he's very disappointed. Yet, nothing can convince Luke about his supremacy over Alucard as he mocks him to be the dog of Helsing. Rest assured, you can count on Alucard to give the best comeback answer as he devours Luke Valentine in his Baskerville hound form. Alucard goes as far to wipe the floor clean of Luke Valentine's blood and remarking that Luke was nothing but a pathetic artificial vampire. And now, he's nothing but dog shit. Pride can really bring you downfall, guys. <laughs> Better learn from Luke Valentine. But the story of Luke Valentine doesn't end here. He makes a minor revival in the Battle of London with just his upper body alive. The traitor turned Walter does use a confused half-bodied Luke Valentine to kill a severely injured Alucard. However, Alucard is always ten steps ahead of this tactic and uses Luke Valentine as his body double to make Luke suffer his second painful death and help Alucard escape from Walter. All in all, Luke Valentine died in Helsing in the most helpless way, and that too twice like a puppet in Alucard's hands. Way to go, Luke! Jan Valentine Jan Valentine is just a young guy off his knockers and drunk on the power that Millennium's artificial vampire chip gives him but he's not without swift judgment. Jan Valentine might be wasted in his own power, but as a fighter, he's super swift and insanely smooth. He has no fear for anyone, human or vampires, or almost any lethal weapon thrown at him. He's the polar opposite of Luke Valentine, and that's what makes the whole duo of the Valentine brothers interesting in the Helsing storyline. Jan Valentine kills for the thrill. He follows Luke's orders, but the killing involves his signature style of mocking, playing around, then running into gunfire, and preferably killing others in point-blank range. Of all the Major's puppets, it's perhaps Jan Valentine who really understands how to best use ghouls. He loves the use of ghouls to overpower enemies with a sheer number they can't expect. It's evident in how Jan and Luke use the ghouls to attack and infiltrate the Helsing Manor while the Round Table Conference is going on. Jan Valentine is easily capable of overwhelming the Helsing Manor forces in the first of what would become a series of assaults on the Helsing Manor in the Helsing storyline. Jan Valentine doesn't shy away from toe-to-toe -to -toe fights and taking fire to his chest or even Walter's intelligent and precise microfilament wire attacks. He even corners Walter to bring him to submission and mocks him for his weakness of old age. But Jan Valentine puts too much trust in his artificial vampire abilities and also its regeneration powers. His overconfidence and reliance makes him nothing more than a blind dog chasing cars, always underestimating that he can always regenerate no matter what, which is precisely what brings about his death. But Jan Valentine's death proves that he just wasn't afraid of death either. He willingly embraces the artificial vampire chip self-destruct incineration as he dies in flames showing Sir Integra the middle finger. Jan Valentine is a maniac but a useful one that helps send a message to the Helsing organization that the Millennium organization is back, and they're back for good. The Colonel The Colonel is the failed general of all the leftover Nazis from World War II hiding in South America. 
Of all the minor characters in Helsing, he has to be the most out of touch with reality. The colonel is under the delusion that the remaining Nazi soldiers work under him and the other high-ranking officials of their failed Nazi Germany state. However, the colonel and other high-ranking officials of the German here are only in for a surprise. It's soon revealed to this weak and aging old colonel that every remaining Nazi soldier has been converted into artificial vampires, except for the colonel and his betrayed band of high-ranking officials. When the colonel resorts to violently assaulting the major, it's revealed by the major that he has no interest in carrying out the dead Hitler's mission to establish the Fourth Reich and has purposefully left out his higher generals out of the artificial vampires program. Enraged and furious about the major's betrayal, the colonel questions the major about his loyalty to Nazism. The Major finally reveals to the Colonel that he was always planning to betray the German Heer officials and the Colonel because his goals are not for the Fourth Reich, but something bigger. This bigger goal being the Millennium's resurgence to attack the Helsing Organization, Alucard and London. It's no surprise that the Major executes all the German Heer officials and the Colonel on a live broadcast sent to the live London summit happening between Iscariot and the table. It's just a shame we don't get to properly see it in either anime. Zorin Blitz Think once again before you romanticize the idea of a goth girlfriend if you're considering Zorin Blitz in that list. She's as dreadful as a woman can get, and she's really not your average goth girl. With sorcery tattooed all over one side of her body, an almost male-like muscular physique, and the best illusion powers at her disposal, Zorin Blitz is the stuff of nightmares you don't want, even for a second. Zorin Blitz is a master at scythe-wielding, and is never seen without her imposing scythe waiting to slice everything in half. Her personality is pretty androgynous, and you can easily mistake her for a man, all thanks to her tall, muscular build and superhuman strength. It literally strikes doubt in her opponents about her gender. She's anatomically a human turned into an artificial vampire, thanks to the Doctor. She's as sadistic as it can get in Helsing and has her own torture sessions before killing off the enemy, finally. Ask Ceres Victoria, and she'll tell you how long the torture lasted. Zorin Blitz's modus operandi for fighting is like that of a hunter who enjoys frightening their prey and killing off their morale first. Zorin will first play around with you and inflict some injuries. Then she'll put a spell on you to keep making you revisit your worst memories. Then she'll unleash her third eye and search through all your memories for the most painful one to assault your mind. If this isn't enough to satisfy her sadistic appetite, her enemies will be trapped in a loop of madness as she uses her scythe to maybe scratch the eye, scrape the skin, or peel it off one inch at a time. Scary? It's just not pleasing to the eye, and least of all, it's a brutal sight to watch on screen. Once again, ask Saris Victoria. Zorin Blitz's bloodthirsty mania can only come second to the Mages. Her pleasure in killing is ruthless, but it also becomes a major flaw in her character, as she can't reason herself out of it. It's sort of like Zorin Blitz ends up becoming a rat walking into its own trap. Her sadistic pleasure of pain traps her into extending it, and ends up wasting a lot of her time by postponing the Millennium's plans, as it's evident through her tendency to violate direct orders. The Major warns Zorin Blitz to not underestimate the Helsing Manor or Ceres Victoria, and she ends up doing both. While enjoying torturing Ceres, the Major runs out of patience for Zorin's antics and finally sends Schrodinger into her illusions to tell her that she's done for. Schrodinger breaks into Zorin's mind and delusions to tell her that she's no longer needed in Millennium's fight. She costs the Major more liabilities than advantage because her bloodlust has become unmanageable for Millennium. True to Schrodinger's word, or let's say the Major's, Ceres Victoria finds enough standby time to power herself and bash Zorin's face across the walls to peel her skin and tattoos off. A brutal death for a brutal killer. The Captain Nobody is as cold and apathetic as the Captain in Helsing. Surprisingly, it's the Captain who's the only Millennium member with some shred of morality. The Captain appears as this indifferent officer in the Millennium who serves as the Major's robotic bodyguard, just waiting for his command. He's usually unaffected by anyone and has no emotion on his face, no matter how good or bad the situation gets. He has an acute sense of morality when it comes to dueling with his opponents. He doesn't believe so much in big talk and humiliating the opponents while he fights with them. No long monologues or any look of disgust in his eyes, he simply doesn't care as long as the job is done or the enemy is killed. He has a high regard for Ceres Victoria and her determination to live and fight for what she thinks is the right cause. Often it's seen that the captain takes a special liking for laser-focused individuals who have singular goals that they'll stand for till their death. As for his role in the Millennium strategies, it's like being their fail-safe cheat code for the last worst-case scenario. The captain is also a character that acts more like an overseer that is duty-bound and might not particularly have a liking for his peers. He's not bloodthirsty, and his actions stem more from the need to do his duty and live by his uniform's motto that his loyalty is the only honor he wears. For the most part of Helsing, this cold and calculating captain is indeed like a loyal dog, but not in the end. The captain essentially commits suicide when he allows Sir Integra to pass through his way and kill the Major. 
It was his job to protect the Major at all costs, and he gave it up. Secondly, he doesn't shy away from giving his all for one last fight with Ceres Victoria by smashing her down floors that led to a chamber full of stolen jewels from World War II-era Jews. The captain's only weakness is silver, and he kicks a silver tooth from this treasure towards Ceres Victoria and essentially gives her the tool for his death. This suicide is like the captain's way of dying with some shred of humanity alive in him as he's visibly tired and disillusioned by the Millennium's meaningless eternal global war agenda. But last-minute regrets don't change the fact that he was a Nazi killing machine, and maybe the only redemption here for the captain is withdrawing from an endless battlefield by putting a full stop to his purpose of serving as a bodyguard war dog for the Major. The Doctor If there's a twisted psychotic doctor that can give the infamous cannibal Dr. Hannibal a run for his money, then it's Millennium's Doctor. The Doctor isn't a cannibal by a long shot, but his mind is twisted enough to bring about any human experimentation to reality. Existing in the Millennium's chain of command as its in-house scientist, this Doctor was responsible for taking the Nazi dream of experimented super-soldiers to its greatest glory. The Doctor has assimilated a wealth of knowledge on human anatomy since the days of World War II and was also instrumental in finding Alucard's first victim, Mina Harker. The Doctor found Mina Harker's partially dead corpse in the dungeon of Alucard that was believed to be non-existent. Mina Harker is as good as dead, but Alucard's essence still lives in her. It becomes the key source for all experimentations that lead to the making of artificial vampires seen in the present-day storyline of Helsing. Out of the extracts of Alucard's essence found in Mina Harker's corpse, the Doctor creates an ingenious conversion process that takes the form of the Freak Chips in the 2001 anime. These chips can be operated into the necks of humans and give them vampiric powers. They can delve deep into the brains of humans and activate vampiric abilities in their anatomy. This anatomical change does give humans vampiric powers, but they're nowhere close to true vampires like Alucard and Ceres Victoria. They have the typical vampiric powers of superhuman strength, durability, endurance, stamina and speed, but these artificial vampires can't generate other vampires. They can only create ghouls, and therefore work in the favor of Millennium's agenda. Millennium can create an army of artificial vampires by using humans who believe in their mission. Since these artificial vampires can't generate vampires, this ensures that no new vampire can turn on Millennium if they don't believe in Millennium's mission. Secondly, only creating ghouls ensures that there's an army of zombie-like mass murderers who will only keep creating more mindless ghouls. This in turn ensures that Millennium and the Major's ultimate goal for eternal war is established. If the entire Earth is overrun with mindless ghouls, the war keeps going on forever with every ghoul either attacking humans or other ghouls. Undead ghouls walking the Earth means that the violence of an eternal war will never end, unless you can bomb the entire Earth with nuclear bombs and finally decimate the planet to a wasteland. Who else could match up to the vision of the Major if not an equally psychotic and sadistic character like the Doctor? Mina Harker Mina Harker's character is derived primarily from the first vampire fiction source of Dracula by Bram Stoker. Pretty much the same, Kota Hirano retains the origin story of the lover and first victim of Dracula for his Mina Harker. Mina Harker, though a literally dead character, does play a crucial role in Millennium's resurgence in the present-day Helsing storyline. If it wasn't for the Doctor finding Mina Harker's corpse in a dungeon, Millennium wouldn't really be able to pull off the Battle of London stunt. All the premise of the Millennium's comeback depended on the usage of Alucard's essence from the corpse of Mina Harker. Mina Harker's corpse was as good as dead, but Alucard's essence still lived in it. This essence was extracted by the Doctor to create Millennium's infamous artificial vampires. It's safe to say that if it wasn't for the tormented corpse of Mina Harker, Millennium and the Major would still be plotting their eternal war in the jungles of South America, and the Helsing organization would be just sipping margaritas before a fireplace. We really wouldn't have the real Helsing storyline without Mina Harker, and the vampirization process that was born out of the ruins of her corpse. Schrodinger Paradox brought to life. Schrodinger is one hell of a funny character and a much-needed break from the sinister obsession of Millennium for an eternal global war, though Schrodinger acts in every way possible to enable it. Schrodinger comes in the appearance of a Hitler Youth Warrant Officer of the Millennium Organization and is the messenger or envoy for the Major. His role is shown to be very insignificant at the start as he jumps in and out of the Helsing Manor, delivering messages, casually flirting with Ceres Victoria, or just breaking the fourth wall for some fairly good comedic moments. He's the adorable Weircat, pet boy of the Major, and can often be seen sitting by the Major's throne or just making fun of him. His insults are often excused by the Major, though the Major is often seen doting on Schrodinger and treating him with the affection of master to a cat. Don't let this fool you. Schrodinger is his ace in the hole to finally take down the mighty Alucard. And it's all possible thanks to the unique anatomy of Schrodinger that's inspired by the scientific and philosophical paradox of Schrodinger's cat. Just like the cat, this seemingly harmless weir cat boy can exist in two places at once. It can also be dead and alive at once.
In Schrodinger's own words, he's here, there, and everywhere, whenever he likes. He needs to just think about it. The same logic applies to his life. If Schrodinger believes he's dead, he can pretty much stay dead. And if he believes he's alive, he can be alive and healthy in an instant. As long as Schrodinger is sentient of this condition, he can just about exist anywhere in the world. That explains his nearly indestructible body and his acute teleportation skills. And Enrico Maxwell hates nobody as much as he hates Schrodinger for his unique anatomy and existence, as Enrico considers this weirdcat boy to be an abomination and an insult to the creative powers of God. Actually, Enrico, he's uh, really a scientific marvel and quite a handy one if you ask the Major. The Major. Finally, the monster of all monsters, or should we say the monstrosity of Helsing doesn't matter. You know the Major, and if you don't, you should surely be scared of him. This meek and weak World War II Nazi veteran is Helsing's biggest villain that's shown to be like a product of World War II hate gone out of control. But that's not really the entire truth. Though the Major started out as a Nazi foot soldier, overseeing camps and being bullied by his peers for being weak, he was always a narcissistic demon hiding in the weak body of a soldier. Right from his origins in World War II, the Major has always been a paradox. On a personal front, he's so proud of his humanity that he rejects an offer to escape death by turning into a vampire because he believes that, powers and all, becoming a vampire would only make him imperfect. He states that inheriting thousands of souls would mean that he'd be adding thousands of imperfections to his human body. In the eyes of the Major, nothing is more perfect than the human form and he has a huge hatred for all the monsters in the world. Alucard has an especially high degree of hatred to deal with from the Major, as is shown in the series. The Major's hatred for Alucard is completely psychotic. On the other hand, even if the Major loves the so-called perfection of the human form, he's more in love with war, as it's made obvious in his I love war speech, that the Major just wants to wage an eternal war because that's how he gets his kick. We're just diluting the seriousness here because the Major's sadism would actually send shivers down Hitler's spine. Hitler wanted war for as long as his delusional dream of a German empire of pure Aryan people was complete, that and Jewish genocide. The Major has no such agenda because he wants war simply because he enjoys watching the horrors of war. He loves watching foot soldiers running scared for their lives, doesn't matter if it's his own soldiers. He loves blitzkriegs and armored tanks destroying villages and cities as people run helter-skelter and that's just it. He just loves the screams, the fires, the bullets raining and people crying to death because it gives him a sense of pleasure that nothing on this earth can give him. His maniacal obsession with war is beyond just sadism. How else would you justify his agenda for a global war that never stops? That's all the Major wants, apart from Alucard's death and the end of the Helsing organization. And that's how it all starts. The creation of artificial vampires. The random and rampant ghoul attacks in the start of Helsing are the master plans of the Major to bring down the credibility of the Helsing organization as a monster-stopping super boy band. That's how humiliating it gets for Sir Integra and Alucard, as the Knights of England question if Helsing is really capable of handling the situation. If this wasn't enough revenge against them, the Major sends an attack from the Valentine brothers while the Round Table conference is going on. It doesn't end here, as the Major flaunts how great of a master strategist he is till the very end of the Helsing series, starting with dummy artificial vampire and ghoul attacks. The Major has been planning the downfall of the Helsing organization Alucard ever since he took refuge in South America after World War II. This close to 50-year wait resulted in the planning of the Battle of London, the artificial vampire chips, conversion of his lead soldiers like Rip Van Winkle, Zorin Blitz, Schrodinger, the Captain and so many more into enhanced monsters. While the majority of the Major's head officers are just used as bait to eliminate Alucard and start the eternal Third World War, one character just trumps all experimentations. That's Schrodinger. While the Major keeps sending Rip Van Winkle, Zorin Blitz and others to drain Alucard, we keep getting convinced that it can't get any worse than this. But not yet. The Major has other trump cards like turning Walter Traitor to make him an artificial vampire that only de-ages as the fight goes on. When this doesn't work, he unleashes his pet weircat, Schrodinger. This 14-year-old looking harmless boy is the paradox Schrodinger's cat brought to life. He can both live and die if he just wishes for it. He can be anywhere at a moment's notice. And using Schrodinger as the final death blow on Alucard? That's one master strategy we never saw coming. Schrodinger commits suicide to drain his blood for Alucard to drink. This strategy helps the Major infect the army of Alucard's familiars, as Schrodinger is neither alive nor dead in Alucard. Talk about strategy and planning. You should really be scared of a general like the Major running the army of any real-world country. The Major has three prominent appearances in Helsing and all show a different era or persona of the character. In his World War II days, the Major appears as a weakling camp staffer who's often bullied by his peers for his weak appearance. But starting from the present, where the story really picks up pace, the Major is a white-suited and menacing fat general, as respectful generals usually get. 
he doesn't seem to have aged a day, and all of that brings us to his third appearance when Sir Integra blows his body with a cannon. It's then revealed that the Major is now a cyborg as well. So much hypocrisy under the love for human perfection. Don't try to reason it, it's a maniacal serial killer general we're talking about here. Marvelous Verdict There's no other verdict that can beat the Marvelous Verdict for this insane cast of characters in the Helsing storyline. It's just bloody, blood for blood going all over London like the La Tomatina Festival, changing its location from Spain to Britain and with blood in everyone's hands. We just have to say hats off to Kota Hirano for pulling off the most bloody vampire franchise in anime. Well, that's enough blood in one Marvelous video. <laughs> Until next time, maybe re-watch Helsing to see what you missed the first time.